time now, the very special part of the show where I really do need to pay very close attention and listen to what's going on. Um, I'm just kidding. So we have on um, an alderman of the 47th Ward. This gentleman is on his second term and he's rounding it out. We are going to talk about how hope is an active thing and things that we can do instead of just beating ourselves over the head with the election. This guy is the real deal. Uh, he is, I think, 36, so a little more in my age range than Rick. So feel hopeful and please give a warm round of applause to Alderman Amea Pawar. Uh, you said I could call you Amea. Yeah. All right, great. Amea. <laughs> I'm going to show up to City Hall and be like, oh, it's cool. I'm, I'm with Amea. Yes, sir. <laughs> we got you on tape. Uh, I'm sorry, I am paying attention, but I didn't write down everything in time. So I have it on my phone. I'm not texting. It's on airplane mode. You're good. Great. You are 36? I am. 36. So you are in your second term, mm -hmm. and that means you were 30 yeah. when you became an alderman. Yeah. Uh, what? Because three year terms. I just Googled that. Um, four. four. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. Tough but fair. Uh, so. Uh, what did you do before you were an alderman? Good question. So I spent a lot of my time um, looking at the connection between disaster and poverty. And so for me, Hurricane Katrina was a life-changing moment um, because you know I was watching stuff on TV and I, I watched politicians get up on TV blame poor black people for not leaving the city without thinking about why they couldn't leave. And so I started thinking about, well, what do I do? And I spent a lot of time looking at um, disasters over the last century. And one of the things that kept coming up is the same problems come up over and over again. Government pretends to not know what's happening in communities before disaster. And then blames people for what happens after disaster. And, and so when you think about um, things like uh, you know, Ferguson, for example, it sits on one of the most dangerous fault lines, and I hope that it doesn't go and there isn't an earthquake in our lifetimes. But it is does sit on a on a fault line. Was and it so? Was it natural disasters specifically? Yeah, yeah, yeah. natural disasters. And the reason why that stuff matters is is their his history impacts what happens um, in the future. And so the way this plays out is so in 1928. Um, during the great floods of the Mississippi River, um, the Army Corps, who was supposed to take care of people, held African Americans at gunpoint, um, and they flooded uh, white fa uh, black farmland to save um, white farmland. But they held African Americans at gunpoint and used them as sandbags, and that also was part of the reason why there's the Great Migration North. Now you fast forward to Katrina, Army Corps, Army Corps. And Spike Lee talks about blowing the levees. Now, there's historical precedent for that, or at least historical basis. When people say, you should have left, why didn't you leave? Well, it wasn't that long ago that they were held at gunpoint and you used as sandbags. So when the government tells you to leave and they're used as sandbags, of course you're not going to trust them 80 years later. But when you don't apologize for that kind of stuff, that's how it plays out. And then when people don't leave, you don't, you act like, uh, that, as if it's like something crazy happened or if people are ignorant or just dumb or make bad decisions. Yeah, they must be watching CNN just like me, you know, up here in Chicago. I remember I was a freshman in college and I can remember being younger and even more ignorant, if you can believe it, more ignorant than I am now. And looking at the TV and going, man, why don't they get out of there? And then, you know, a few years later going, wow, they probably didn't have that helicopter view. For and no one ever CNN. took the time over the last 80 years to say sorry or to make good with the community or repair relationships. And this is going to play out, hopefully, again, not in our lifetimes, but if there's an earthquake in St. Louis, <coughs> guess who's responding? It's Ferguson PD. And they haven't made good, apologized, but rebuilt community relations. And so this is sort of what I've spent a lot of time looking at, which is um, how government fails to interact with their communities, fails to make good for mistakes in the past. 
but also fails to understand how communities change and uh, how they have and flow. And so that's the thing. It's there's so much to this. I mean, there's infrastructure. There's there's natural like a knowledge of like geography and like geology. There are there's cultural understanding. I mean, there there is so much to this. Well, they're called disasters to the impact human beings, right? Otherwise, it'd just be sort of a natural recurring event. Um, it's and, a bunch of fish, and they all grow, 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 right? Right. <laughs> I hate fish. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, you were in the Office of Emergency Management yeah. uh, at uh, Northwestern. Northwestern. Yeah. Office of Emergency Management, which is uh, probably why there's talk of you running for governor, uh, governor, because you can manage an emergency. And there's there's a... That's a burn on Rounder, by the way. <laughs> but we'll get to that. We'll get to that. So, I mean, you were in the Office of Emergency Management. You started to run for alderman. Mm -hmm. You, uh, your, your office to get elected was out of a bowling alley, Timber Lanes. Mm -hmm. um, you were considered an underdog. You stashed all your signs and all your equipment and stuff in that bowling alley. You had a van. You went out. Mm -hmm. Apparently, the first two, three quarters of that election, I mean, you had an uphill climb, right? The guy you were running against, uh, I mean, he was pretty well situated in the community. He was. He was a 36-year incumbent. And, um... <laughs> and that's 436 divided by 4. Mm -hmm. um... <laughs> 9! <laughs> 36. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Um, so, I mean, but, but you won. Yeah. So how did that happen? We knocked on doors. I think um, one of the things that... I learned early on uh, about politics was that you know money doesn't always have to be the deciding factor. That um, you can out hustle someone, um, and you can match money with, with with shoe leather, right? And so obviously that's a little bit tougher on a on a bigger scale, um, on a on a in a district that's bigger than a ward. It's a little harder to do. It's certainly harder at, at the citywide level, but. Ultimately, what I think comes down to is you go out and face people and you tell them who you are and what you stand for, um, and you can never go wrong doing that. That seems fair to me. Um, being told, we may need you to speak up a little more. Okay. Um, I'm also being told I don't have an earpiece. <laughs> <laughs> is that true? <laughs> I, we're very low budget. <laughs> but I think you're right. You can out-hustle somebody, and clearly you did. You won. And then you won your re-election, because this is your second term as alderman. Yep. Um, plenty of things that you've done over the course of these two terms. Um, the Office of Independent Budget Analysis is something you've established, which there was no, basically, oversight for uh, city budgets except uh, aldermanic approval. Like, it was your job to go through the whole thing and vote for it or don't vote for it. Um, uh, Indigenous People's Day, I believe you worked on that instead of calling it Thanksgiving here in the city of Chicago. Very cool, very cool. We like that. Um, the other, the staff is good. I've learned that. I, I looked it up as well. <laughs> um, the, you're also involved in Fight for 15. Uh, not too long ago, you were at O'Hare with yeah. some other aldermen uh, protesting Fight for 15. I guess my question is, uh, 15 what? $15 an hour. Okay, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. I got it. I got it. So how did it go? Were you striking with, because the worker, the bag handlers were striking as well? Yeah, so there are a lot of people at O'Hare. For example, you guys know that the people who push your wheelchairs, or push the wheelchairs, they um, are not paid. They work on tips only. And because of federal law, they can't ask for tips. So you would just have to know to tip them. So if they ask for tips, the FBI is like dots on their forehead, like, get, yeah. get on the ground! Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an unfortunate situation. So what, what's happened is, a lot of these jobs used to be union jobs with the airlines, and after we deregulated uh, post 9-11 to help the airlines out, uh, the airlines subcontracted these jobs out, and um, these contractors, um, they're terrible actors. They treat people like dirt. And so I think it's, and I think the only way to get people to be treated fairly is through unionization. And so we're... Uh, So we're working with SEIU. You know, we're trying to get um, the airlines to the table. They're doing well now. They have record profits. The airlines, yeah. Profits. There were a few years there where they weren't doing so well. But Fuel was high, uh, flying was now. down. But they're they're okay. doing just fine now. They're making plenty of money. And so what we're saying is, um, we're not asking for much. It's scraps. 
We're asking for basic dignities that most people enjoy when they go to work. And so I think whether it's $15 an hour paid sick leave, um, making proper accommodations for pregnant women, um, making sure that you have proper language accommodations for lots of immigrants and refugees who work and clean the planes, it's not too much to ask. Woo. I'm sure the airlines have different ideas. But then again, I think that's why you were there with SEIU and, and the workers who were there, and a few aldermen as well, and other uh, politicians from Illinois who were kind of banded yeah. together and said, yeah. hey, uh, this is a thing, hello. Yeah, I mean, the airlines are cutting deals in other cities, right? They did so in Philadelphia before the Democratic uh, Convention, because no one wanted SEIU to strike, right? And, yeah. and it would have been a... And the paralyzing the paralyzing O'Hare is a big deal. Yeah, I mean, that's... so what we're hoping to do is um, continue to call attention to what's going on at O'Hare and get the airlines just to cut a deal. That's all. We're not asking for much. Fair enough. I'll pass it along next time I take spirit. <laughs> <laughs> they are jerks. <laughs> um, so there's talk of uh, you uh, run for mayor. Yeah. Uh, I think you started that to be fair. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, please, sir, you have the floor. I mean, I think if it's an open seat, I'll, um, I'll definitely run. But I think um, part, of, part of what I'm looking at is, I think more, more than anything, is I think after Trump, uh, and especially what's happening in Illinois, I think 2018 has to be the, um, has to be the goal. I think that the mayoral race is, it's a ways off. I know it's a year after the governor's race, but I think, uh, or a year after the um, the governor's race, but I think the, the priority right now has to be 2018. We should figure that out. We'll, we'll look it up. Um, but I mean, you know, that's that's the thing that keeps coming up. It's saying, the, oh, you know, 2018 is so far away. I can't believe we're already talking about this, but I think that what we're going for here tonight is that, you know, we want to be hopeful in the face of everything that's been going on, even with this terrible satire I've been beating over your head with. But uh, to look forward, I mean, that's the next round. And to organize before that, I mean, you can't just show up in 2018 and be like, okay, vote for me. Oh, dang it. Mm -hmm. So I think part of it is, um, I think we have to change the narrative, right? So I talked a little bit about failures of government during and after disaster. But part of what I've always felt is that government can, and often is, a force for good. But it's only a force for good if you elect people who believe it's good. And so if we continue to elect people who hate the job that they seek out, who hate the institution they want to represent, you're not going to get good results. And so I think part of what I would like to do, what I'm trying to do, is force the conversation to move away from worshiping wealth and people who want to run government like a business and try to get people to think about serving everyone equitably rather than serving the bottom line. Does that make sense? I think it does. I think, I think it does make sense. Uh, I mean, you just mentioned not running government like a business, uh, treating people, people equitably, uh, paying them a fair share. So I'm going to try to, to pivot to Governor Rounder here. I don't know how to make <laughs> that transition <laughs> to that, but I'm, just bear with me. Yeah. Um, because there's also talk of you running for governor. So, I mean, I think you've got to pick a lane, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, I mean, I would, maybe you can do both. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but um, the, the mayor thing, you said if it's an open seat, you'd go for it, which means if Ron doesn't go for uh, round three, you will go for it. Mm -hmm. um, so if Ron goes for round three, because you are actively uh, raising money right now. Mm -hmm. So if Ron does uh, go for that campaign, looks like uh, the next brass ring is uh, the governorship. Um, I mean, you just mentioned running it like a business, treating people equitably. Um, something else that you've talked about is that uh, government is made of the people. I think you just mentioned it's important to treat government as, you know, we are the government, right? We elect these people. We can run as well. So it's important to look at it as us as opposed to this monolith that other people run. But you also mentioned um, you get the government you pay for. Mm -hmm. And that has to do with taxation. But, I mean, I really think that you should tell that to Governor Rauner because he sunk a ton of money into these races. 
and it didn't work. It, he didn't get a lot of the ROI that he was looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, that's return on investment, by the way. <laughs> um, he saw that we had a Susana Mendoza last month, and they ran ad after ad after ad after ad against her of Rounder's own money. It didn't work. How do you explain that? that? That it is systemic, it is bad that there's so much money in the system, but it just seems like it's not actually working, so there might be some room for you to make a difference. Yeah, I mean, I think, so again, going back to being go having uh, narrative be government being forced for good, um, part of what's also missing is um, people who are elected in office not going to their constituency and telling them that taxes aren't evil, right? So we can talk about fair taxes and whether they're regressive or progressive, um, but taxes in and of themselves are not terrible, they're not evil, and that costs go up, and so you have to raise revenue incrementally. So I, you know, I, I voted in favor of the property tax increase, and I was, and I campaigned on it from my re-election, which is you be, cannot keep going to voters and saying we can do more with less. Because when you keep telling people you do more with less, eventually you do less with less. Because what drives privatization is this idea that you need to do more with less and make it more efficient when really all you're doing is incentivizing. <laughs> right, you get it. I hate Ventra! Yeah. <laughs> Who likes Ventra? <laughs> and where did that come from? It was because the city didn't have the money, so the CTA sold it's like the parking meters but for the trains, yeah. right? So if you think about all these, yeah, exactly. So if you think about all the legacy costs that we're having to pay right now, had we just raised revenue over the last 30 years incrementally so people could have prepared for them, we would not be in a position where we have to sock it to them all at once. Um, but my point is, over the long term, we'll be in a better place. But if the conversation is constantly, taxes are terrible, and you have people like Grover Norquist at the national level. God, is he it, still around? Yeah, he is. Oh where you God. make people sign pledges not to raise taxes. Um, eventually, you just do less with less, and then you've got everyone ticked off. And then you eventually have to pay for stuff. Right? People all depend on services, and the idea is that you know, we pay taxes knowing that we may not need services today, but we also understanding that our life may not be perfect, right? that one day we may also get into some issues. Damn. And so we would want the rest of society to help us out as we help society out um, when we were in a good place. Um, and the only way to get to that is to change the narrative that taxes aren't evil. That taxes is money that we spend on us, which I mean seems okay. I mean I have squandered so much time, but you just you have a sonorous voice. I am I'm so that's not the right word. I'm awake. <laughs> Shit. Uh, <laughs> you no, know, it's interesting. And you have I mean you do this every day. I mean you talk about how being an alderman is just like any other job. There's people you don't get along with, you have good days, you have bad days, sometimes people take your ideas, but you gotta get up, tie your shoes, and go to work. Um, <laughs> You also mentioned that a lot of times in po politics you run into the fact that some people are just the same people they were in high school. <laughs> Please tell us who Ram is stuffing into lockers at City Hall. <laughs> no, all right now. Yeah, yeah. So you said you also so the run for governor. I've been dancing around this yeah. the, the whole time. You want to run for governor? Um, I mean, why? Things are going so well. <laughs> I don't understand why you want to make a change in Springfield. Uh, it's just running very smoothly. Um, do you think that's a great idea? Um, you know, I, uh, Governor Rauner, uh, to catch up, I just read the newspaper earlier, um, and it turns out that uh, this, remember there was almost a, we have John Cohen actually works on this show with me. He's a member of the Chicago Teachers Union. Hello, John. Say hello, John. <laughs> CTU worked very hard to work out a deal uh, so that they could be paid for their pensions, which is the thing you get after you retire, so you can eat food, um, which seems important. Um, and now there's been a veto in Springfield that makes it so that money for uh, that deal actually isn't going through by Governor Rauner's behest. Um, it seems like Governor Rauner just says, we can't pay for it. Okay, you're also saying taxes aren't bad. What else would you change about, you know, like pie in the sky, okay? You get 95% of the vote. I think you got everybody's here so far. <laughs> what do you do? What do you change? I mean, what, what are your big uh, picture ideas for governors? I mean, I think it first starts by recognizing that we have the fourth richest economy in the country, right? It's a, Illinois. We have a seven, so despite what everyone tells you and how terrible it is over here, um, we have a $700 billion economy. Um, 
It is bigger than most co most countries around the world. So the fact, it's not true that we are some sort of downtrodden state, that things are falling apart. Things are fine. It's a matter of will and, and taxing fairly. And so I think part of it is also recognizing that while we might have the fourth largest economy, we spend absolutely the least amount of money of any state in the union on public education. Say that again. Oh. We spend the least amount of money on public education. We're the fourth wealthiest state. Yeah. Huh. Um, <laughs> that doesn't seem to, to bode well for uh, the future. Yeah, so you need to think about inequality, and you think about inequity, and... <laughs> it's tough. Uh, it's tough. We're hopeful. <laughs> We're hopeful. Active hope. That's the next question about what we do next, but please. So, you, you know, you have a graduated income tax. That means that for most people in Illinois, you pay less, but if you make over 150 or 200,000, whatever you set that ceiling at you would pay a much higher rate and it would be graduated. So the higher, the more you make, the more you pay. Um, most states, even Wisconsin, which is Scott Walker country. Indeed. Um, they have a graduated income tax and they generate billions more than Illinois. So the idea that um, somehow this state is broken um, and you hear that rhetoric from the governor, it's just, it's just not true. And I think part of that means recognizing again that it, it takes a lot of political will to change the state constitution to pass a graduated income tax. So, I mean, that's a whole, that's a constitutional thing. Um, I mean, I just saw that on November 17th, the amount of money that the state of Illinois owes itself is over $10 billion mm -hmm. as of November 17th. And now this is over a year of not having a budget, obviously. Is it just taxes? Is it just raising people's taxes, making sure that the rich pay their fair share? I mean, is that all that needs to be done to fill this hole and to fix what's wrong? I mean, we stopped paying for social services. Um, we're starving them. We've cut childcare subsidies. So we, childcare subsidies, for example, we help working families get childcare so they can go to work. And Governor Rauner is all about opportunity. So how do you create opportunities for people when you take them away by making it impossible for them to go to work because now they don't have childcare subsidies? I mean, it's the thing- Child labor. Like, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's pretty silly with me, man. I don't know. He might like that. <laughs> Please, we want you on, man. I got a chair for you. Please continue. It's a, it's, a, it's a moral. It's a moral. I think, ultimately, government, the budget, it's just paper. It's an institution we've created, but the underlying belief is that we're here to take care of one another. And if all it is is just dollars and cents and a bottom line, well, that's how we keep, and we worship wealth, that's how you get with guys like Bruce Rauner. It's not gonna change unless we start rethinking government and thinking about doing good and doing things rather than stopping things, funding things rather than cutting them. <laughs> I, I agree. I, I agree. Um, did I already tell the emergency management joke? Yeah, I, I did. Okay. I worked hard on that. <laughs> Holy. Okay. Well, that's, that means we're wrapping up. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. So, I mean, we are, we're trying to talk about active hope. Yeah. You are a guy who wasn't in politics. You ran. You, you got it done. It is about hustle. Um, for us citizens, for people who live in the city, um, uh, what do you recommend as an alderman in terms of uh, being actively hopeful? Is it donating money? Is it getting involved with causes like the SEIU, uh, things like CARE that Arish was talking about? Uh, what, what do you think? I think it's all of it. I would, I would urge people to run for office, run for local office. I mean, um, do you mean me? I mean, yeah. <laughs> I think you mean me. Rauner's trying to push drug tests for governor employees, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> That's a uh, different note. But yes, I mean... <laughs> I think run for office, I would, uh, you know, get involved with organizations like Planned Parenthood with CARE. Um, go work with uh, organizations that work with refugees. Go see what they have gone through. You know, immigrants and refugees have literally walked across continents, have been warehoused. Um, they come here for a better life, and most Americans can trace 
their families back to immigrants or refugees. And so I would, I would just start thinking about um, stop making other people the other. We have to stop doing that. And, and part of that is go out and meet your neighbors, get off Facebook and Twitter and go out into the community and get involved with these organizations because they're doing incredible work. And, and especially with this new administration, all of these organizations are going to need the help. I couldn't agree more. Um, so, I mean, if, if you were to run for governor, when would we know? How can we keep up with this? <laughs> like, how, like, you know, do we just check your Twitter? Do we, like, come into the office? You're at the 47th Ward. We can go pop in, be like, hey, you need anyone to answer phones? Uh, you know, truthfully, I really don't know. Um, I've got a nine-month-old. And Aww. so... And he came here. <laughs> Fair the function. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 my, my, my perspective right now is um, we've got a lot of wealthy people that want to get involved in politics, and especially on the Democratic side. I don't care what we stand for. We know what Bruce Rauner stands for. He tells us every day what he stands for. My question is, as Democrats, what do we stand for? And so I get it on the totem pole. I'm way down here. Um, it's highly unlikely uh, on a governor's race. but. Um, I've got two years left before I leave politics, so I might as well use that time to push and try to get a progressive platform on the Democratic side. And you know, whoever the nominee is, if we run a centrist, we're not going to win. We need to run a progressive platform. So. Seventh Ward, we are going to keep our eyes peeled, whether it's mayor, governor, dog catcher, I don't care. You got my vote. Guys, give it up for all the mayor man. Party. Uh, let me turn off uh, airplane mode here and check, see who, who used the hashtag. Anyone use the hashtag? <laughs>